Thanks for the introduction, Greta. Thanks to the organising committee as well for giving me the opportunity to present to you a, a new R package for mechanistic niche modelling, which is relevant to the broad scientific theme of this conference of trying to understand how climate constrains the distribution and abundance of organisms. Okay, I'm just going to find the forward button. Which is the forward button? Green. Green one. And the laser would be the laser picture. Okay. Um, so we have an increasingly rich array of environmental layers with which to tackle this problem. Uh, and the most typical way of using them, which um, Camille actually touched on in her talk, is the correlative species distribution modelling approach, where our starting point is the known distribution of the species. Here's an example. Oops, how do I go back? Um, so here's the distribution of the Australian sleepy lizard. And what we do is we choose a set of predictor variables that we have some idea are likely to be important in limiting the, the distribution. We query those layers uh, at the sites where we know the species occurs and describe statistically in some way an environmental space which we then map onto the landscape to see where else the organism may occur and how that may change as we change those layers. And this is a very powerful approach because it's a process implicit approach. So even if we don't quite have the right mechanisms in mind, any process that's statistically related to those predictor variables can potentially be picked up in the model, and so we may still get a good model. But that advantage of the correlative modelling approach is also a limitation because we can't unpack our model and find out what processes we captured, and that may be important just from a pure scientific satisfaction point of view, but it may also be important from a management point of view if we want to actually change any of those processes. And Camille gave you some examples about how knowing the details of some of these processes can be really useful. So if we want to take that approach, we want a mechanistic species distribution modelling approach or a mechanistic niche modelling approach where we have some very specific processes in mind and we want to take as our starting point not the distribution of the species but the functional traits of that organism and connect them in some way to our predictor variables that we have available using equations that depict those hypothesized mechanisms. Now this is, has its own limitations and challenges, and one of the challenges is there's so many processes you could possibly choose from to try and model. But one ubiquitous set of processes are the thermodynamic constraints on organisms. They're omnipresent. The um, basic physicochemical constraints on organisms. So that is a good place to start. And my co-author on this talk, Professor Warren Porter, was a pioneer of developing ways to apply thermodynamic principles to understanding these kinds of constraints on organisms. So in thermodynamics, what you're doing is you're defining a system boundary around some part of the universe and you're following the flows of energy and matter in and out of that system boundary. And for an organism, the natural boundary is around the individual organism. And what we're trying to do is basically solve this eco-physiological problem of how the organism is exchanging heat, um, water, gases, and food as it goes through its life cycle. And you want to try and understand uh, what combinations of environments are enabling that organism to survive in, in a particular environment on the basis of these equations, these physical equations. And this general approach is called biophysical ecology. And the field was really started in the 70s, particularly with this paper of Warren Porter's from Ecologia in 1973, where he teamed up with some engineers and they worked out the equations, the physical equations, and coded them into some computer programs, which um, later on uh, I suggested we call Niche Mapper, because you're basically t trying to characterize with these equations the fundamental or thermodynamic niche of the organism and map that onto a habitat. Now, half the battle in trying to do this is getting the environment experienced by the organism right in terms of the variables that those equations demand, um, because those equations demand particular variables. You, ca you can't just choose. And so really that involves, in the terrestrial world, understanding microclimates, and microclimates vary dramatically through space and time. And there's all sorts of processes going on that determine these microclimates, including the basic weather, prop uh, weather conditions, and also um, effects on solar radiation of terrain and, and shade. There's the soil, mo um, soil properties, including soil moisture, and you heard about how important, important soil moisture can be from Camille in the, in the previous talk. And other things, including in a place like Mount Wel Wellington towering over us, um, snow. So the model that Porter and his colleagues put together uh, captures all of these processes, and we've added some others 
uh, along the way. So we have this really powerful microclimate model that's really useful for a whole lot of problems in ecology, including the ones we're thinking about uh, at this meeting. But it really hasn't been used that much and to the extent it really should be. And one of the, there are a few reasons for this, but one of the reasons is it was written in the language of the 70s, which is Fortran. How many people program in Fortran in this room? <laughs> Good on you. <laughs> um, so the, the, it existed for most of its uh, time as a basically a Fortran executable, and it was very clunky to get data in, it was very clunky to get data out, and also it wasn't particularly well documented, there weren't really good help files. Um, so what I've done, it turns out that R, which is the language of ecologists now, um, <coughs> you can call Fortran, and it also has really nice ways of documenting um, programs and, and providing help files and so on. So what I've done is taken the niche mapper package and put it into the niche, map, or the niche mapper Fortran programs and had them have them called by the niche map R package, basically. So in R, you can write these wrapper scripts that interact with the Fortran code, and then you can have your um, scripts that you put your input data into, and there's one for the microclimate model in this package called microglobal, in, into which you can put your settings for how you want the microclimate model to run and your location, and then it calls a, or it queries a database for your location of interest of um, global climate that comes with the model so you can get started with something straight away and this global climate database might well be useful um, for your research, research problems. Um, and that's based on the new and colleagues 2002 long-term average global climatology which has all the variables that the model needs. And there's optionally a um, soil moisture, global soil moisture data set and a global aerosol data set that you can use. And then it produces a set of outputs. And I should say that you can, if you have a different data set that you want to feed into this model, you can, you can just start with the, the scripts that are already there and modify them to have your own data come into the modeling system and go into the Fortran code. And then you get a series of outputs with the microclimate model, you get um, a, an output of above ground conditions, of soil temperatures, and then if you turn the soil moisture modeling option on, you get soil moisture, soil water potential, and soil humidity. To give you an idea about what it looks like when you're using it in R, this is the R Studio environment, which is highly recommended for working with R. On the right here, you can see uh, the help file for the microglobal script, which has all of the inputs and outputs and what the default settings are. And then you can see three lines of code up here that calls the library and then runs the model and extracts out the predicted soil temperatures. And I've just kept all the default settings and just changed the location to Hobart, Australia. And then if we look at the output uh, data frame of the soil, um, the soil output, you can see you've got the day of the year and the hour of the day. And then for every hour, we've got estimates of the depth, temperature at all the different depths. And you can plot that. And this is what it looks like for soil temperature in January. And there are um, plotting example scripts in, in the examples uh, that come within the help file. In addition, there is a tutorial vignette that you can access through the package that step-by-step -step goes through how to run the model and all the different sorts of settings you can run it with. There's a very detailed um, document about all the theory and equations. Pretty much every single equation is in there that the model is using, so you really know exactly what it's doing. And then there's a, a summary table of all the inputs and outputs as well. So that is the microclimate model, and that may well be all you need for your particular research problem. Or you may want to make some calculation about the energy mass budget of an actual organism. And to this end, currently in the niche mapper package, we have a function for working with ectotherms. The endotherm uh, model is, is, is in progress. But we have the ectotherm model. So it ha you can input your morphology, physiology, behavioural traits that you have measured for your organism. And then it also takes as input the, directly the output from the microclimate model for two different extremes of shade. And then it works through that microclimatic data using your parameters of your, your animal and works out each hour where could the organism be within its habitat, how deep underground must it go, how much shade would it need, and then what body temperature would it, would it have, um, how much water would it be losing. And so you get a, a series of output tables, and if we have a look at an example of what it looks like running the ectotherm model in the R environment, 
You can see this is the help screen for the Ectofem model, shows you all, again, all the default settings, and the default settings are for the Australian water skink. And what I've done is I've run the model with the outputs from that Hobart simulation of the microclimate, and I've kept all the defaults, but I've changed the parameters so we have the foraging body temperature range between 35 and 30 degrees. This lizard likes to be at 33 degrees. It will bask if it can be 20 degrees or warmer, and it will come out of its hole as long as, it can be, as, long as it's warmer than 10 degrees. So run that, and you open up the Environ table, and that gives you a list of, again, the day of the year and the hour of the day, and then the core temperature, how much shade it selected, how deep it went, and then the actual environment it experienced given the behaviours that it ended up choosing. And to show you a plot of, of that output, what we have here is for each typical day of each month of the year, we ha and we have uh, in black the body temperature cycling, so you can see them regulating around 33, and, 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 and uh, we have the, the voluntary maximum and minimum limits that we gave it for activity here how much shade they selected, and you can see them selecting more shade in the warmer months, how deep they went, and in Hobart, this lizard had to go really deep to get away from the cold in the winter. And then the activity state, which uh, the low value there is basking and the high value is foraging. And you can see the activity pattern better with a plot like this, uh, where you have the day of the year along the x-axis and the hour of the day along the y, and then in the dark blue, the nighttime hours, which aren't available because it's a diurnal lizard, and in uh, orange, the foraging hours, where they were between those uh, voluntary foraging temperatures and then the light blue, the basking uh, hours, when they could be above 20. And you can see in this particular case, we have a period of inactivity imposed by the cold in, in Hobart for this lizard. <clears throat> so that's the ectotherm model running in, in, this, in, the, in just calculating the heat and water budget of, or elements of the water budget of the organism. But you may want to go further than that and, and predict something about the animal growing and developing and reproducing in that environment. And there are a few different ways of approaching that. I think one of the best ways is um, Koyman's dynamic energy budget theory, which is a very physics type um, model of metabolism of an organism. And I've included that as the on-board on energetics model in the, in the um, in, in niche mapper, in the ectotherm model. So you can optionally turn that on if you want, or you can do your own energetics model just being driven by the outputs um, from, from the heat and water budget model. But if you do turn the dynamic energy budget model on then you'll, uh, and you have the parameters for your species, then you'll, in addition, get a growth trajectory. This is wet mass through time, and you can see the animal going, developing it matures, and then these little blips here are reproduction events. So here's the slide I showed earlier comparing correlative and mechanistic models. And remember, with correlative models, we're producing a map of probability of distribution. Whereas with a mechanistic model, we're plotting a variety of different possible outputs that represent constraints. And so in the simplest case, with this niche map R package, you could potentially plot potential activity time or, or risk of overheating or getting too cold. Or you could take it all the way through in the most extreme cases I've done here with a sleepy lizard and do a dynamic energy budget model and predict something um, like reproduction potential, which is what's plotted in this figure here. These two kinds of modelling approaches are complementary and probably best when they're used in tandem because you can e see just, just briefly comparing these maps here, there's some really intriguing differences between them in what they're predicting. And understanding why these kinds of models are different will give a lot more insight into understanding climatic limitations than just using one approach on its own. So if, to get the models, uh, they're actually currently on my, uh, available through my GitHub um, repository. <coughs> They're not on CRAN yet. Uh, and so the code, this is the link for the code and the installation binaries, but really just go to the, um, my lab's website to the resources page and there's the instructions for how to um, obtain it and install it. Uh, as I, I, I mentioned, there's quite a bit of documentation for the microclimate model. There's a software note in review. Um, the ectotherm model is following closely behind in terms of documentation. The endotherm model is on its way. And uh, I'd like to finish by acknowledging the Australian Research Council and the Victorian Life Sciences Computation Initiative for their support. And I hope that in releasing this package, we see a whole lot more mechanistic <coughs> analyses of how and why species are on the move. Thank you very much. <laughs>